chapter 8. We'll start there in verse number 12, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Then I committed mirth because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God, uh, which God giveth him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes, then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yet farther, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bless tonight. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to draw us closer to you to be a help. Lord, give us principles from your word tonight. Again, that will change us and, and help us to make decisions and, and to be encouraged, uh, Lord, in our life with you. So Lord, help me to be clear and to tie this together and uh, use it to strengthen us. Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know Christ, Lord, we do pray that even this evening they would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. May you be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. Please, Lord, guide what I say and how I say it. I certainly know I need your grace and mercy. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So last week when we were in chapter 8 here, the first portion, of course, dealt with the government and, and our responsibilities before government. A very interesting text with a lot of practical help there. And then he got into last week, uh, really the importance of proper perspective when you're looking at different things in life. Like uh, not knowing the future, but God does. Like as he was finishing up in verse 11, where not understanding God's justice and God's grace. When God judges and his grace. And dealing with where sometimes you'll see somebody who is in sin and God doesn't judge it immediately. And we, and we dealt with that. He's continued along those lines and really given advice now in life with what he's seen. Again, we're having the perspective of a man, don't lose sight of that, who God is using to write the book. His perspective of this man who had this incredible relationship with God, and then, and then for a long time frame fell and went back, and, and during that time trying to find meaning apart from his life from God, unsuccessfully. And now here he is in his last years looking back on his life and the Lord is using this man to give us this wisdom. Even today he gives great help that we need every day in our life on perspective that he's providing. He's providing advice in different areas for the most part to prevent discouragement, to prevent things that sometimes that we see and we get focused on them too much and we become discouraged. And so he's given advice how to navigate those because of, uh, he, he recognized very quickly in his wisdom, the sin cursed earth, there is sin abounding everywhere and trying to find meaning and trying to find understanding. And so anyhow, he's continuing along those lines here with the rest of chapter eight and gives a lot of very practical helps. Principles that can help us really in all areas of life. We're gonna see at times, we can look on others, maybe some who have turned from the Lord and seem to be succeeding. While we look at others, other, another group who, of people who are serving God, and yet they seem to be struggling. If not careful, we can draw wrong conclusions 
based on surface observations. Solomon, we're also going to look at tonight, not only that, what we look at, we'll dive into, where we can also allow things that we perceive as an injustice, or at times, an injustice at the moment, a genuine injustice at the moment, and allow that to discourage us. Perhaps like an election that has a result that makes no sense, and all of a sudden we live in discouragement because of it. To many, what just happened was a great injustice. But then we allow it to affect us in discouragement, thinking it's no use, it's all rigged. Again, it can affect how we approach life, it can affect how we make decisions, the attitude we have, and it can lead to discouragement. He also deals with, as he finishes, a really important thing that if you're not careful can be very discouraging, and that is know how to handle things that you can't understand and you can't know. To have a proper perspective of things you simply can't understand and you can't know. And you think about what he's dealing with, right? It's an important area. And this is coming, again, think of the man the Lord's using to pin these words in. So let's take a look at this tonight. I think there's several good things here that will be a help to us in our everyday life. All right, let's look at verse 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely, I love his confidence when he's giving this out. He knows this is going to happen and he is right. Yet surely I know that it shall, be, it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days. We are, and he puts, it, puts that in context now. He's not contradicting himself at all. Which are as a shadow. Because he feareth not before God. So what we're going to do with this one to make it practical, we're going to see what he's talking about. And how I've labeled this first point is like this. There's several things that we need to consider as we're approaching life. This one is to consider eternity when you're living your life. Consider eternity. Earlier in in verse 11, of course, he dealt with the man who gets emboldened to sin because God does not judge it immediately. And what happens? And so from there, he comes into verse 12 now. He brings out a, a really great point to think on. He talks about the man that does evil continually. And yet his days are prolonged. Again, that judgment's not hitting quickly. He's living well. He has good health. And yet over and over and over and over, the wickedness is there, the rebellion against God, the hatred for God, the ignoring God, however, whatever's taking place. It's a man who's living apart from God. And yet, everything's fine. But what Solomon reminds you is this. Consider his end. Consider eternity. You can take the one who does not fear God, the unconverted man. This is what Solomon is saying. You can take him at his best, in his prosperity, in his health, in his greatness, and it shall not be well with him when it's all said and done. Doesn't matter how great everything is for him now, it's not ending well. It will not. You can take the child of God, the one who fears God, even at his worst, it shall be well with him. He's reminding you to keep it in perspective. Keep it in perspective. Think on the end of the wicked. Psalm chapter 73. Look at Psalm 73. Verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Again, just like Solomon's talking about, you can see the wicked, everything's going well for them, they have no problems, yet they're living against God. Yet the man who's living for God is struggling. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. And and he continues. Uh, We'll we'll skip down here a few verses. Um, They're corrupt, verse 8, speaking wickedly, concerning oppression, they speak folly. And he's just listening to their wickedness, and yet they're prospering. But look at verse, let me jump down here. You see a mocking God in verse 11. Um, Let's go all the way down to verse 17. He says this. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I 
their end. What he put back into perspective is eternity. What's going to happen in the end? He, he realized it really doesn't matter right now how successful they are, what words they're saying, because in the end, if they don't get that right, oh, consider their end. I, I, was, I was thinking about hell today when I was preparing this. I don't have a section on it, but I was at this point, and, 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 and just trying to think of, of what is the most misery that I've been in, and not so much physical, but more emotional in my thought life. And to imagine that never being able to end. No hope from it. Nothing you can do. No relief. It, again, as, as the psalmist did in Psalm 73, and as uh, uh, Solomon did there in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, he's saying, listen, this is one thing I do know as he enters this. I know what their end is. I know that those that fear God, it shall be well. But I know that the wicked, although the days are prompt, looks great now, it will not be well. He's considering their end. <clears throat> so, how does this help us? One, know this. There is nothing worth exchanging your fear of God or your life with God, your walk with God. There's nothing worth it on this earth. Nothing. No level of prosperity, no level of greatness. There's nothing. You keep eternity in mind when you make decisions in life. When you're deciding which direction to go, you allow eternity to direct that. Not wealth, not long life, not pleasure. Soon this will all be over and eternity is what matters. Make decisions based on that. You consider eternity in how you live your life. The key is to have that fear of the Lord as you're going through life. You can think of the rich man in, uh, who is in hell right now. He certainly did not fear God. You can think of the, uh, of the parable of the rich man who built his barns and his soul was required of him. He was a fool. I just preached on Demas. You can look at his life. And these are people that made decisions without considering eternity. The rich man, the man who built his barns, Demas when he forsook Paul, Judas, Solomon, for that matter. Compare these men to the Apostle Paul, whose life was cut short when he was beheaded, who spent a significant amount of time in prison, who traveled almost constantly, his head in a different place time after time after time. Even with those he was working on, at times, turning against him. Frustrations building over, over what he is trying to accomplish for the Lord. And, and all of a sudden, Judaizers come in. False doctrine comes in. The Gnosticism comes in and just corrupting everything. And the life that that man lived. But what he kept in mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, was eternity. You think about this. If Paul could go back to, let's say, around 40 A.D., would he choose to reject Christ? There's no way. There is no way he would. He would make the exact same choice and he would serve him even greater right now. But let's take Demas. Would he decide differently? Yes, he would. How about that rich? We already know the rich man in hell would. Begging for somebody to go to his family. He knew. I, I did not have this in mind. I didn't have eternity in mind. Everything was well for me. I thought I was fine. But just like Solomon said, doesn't matter the prosperity of the wicked. It's not going to go well for them. And it doesn't matter the struggles of the Christian. It will go well for you. It will. Verse 14. He considers, considers something else to help you in life when discouragement, when, when discouragement comes. The first one really helps you make decisions in life and keep eternity in mind. What happens in the end, in other words. This one is consider eternity along the same vein, but it goes a different route with it when there's, a, when there's injustice occurs. Oh, I'm not there. Let me get back there myself. It says, There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. 
I said that this also is vanity. So he's dealing with injustices that do occur. Many times we see that in regards to, uh, we probably have different examples even in our own life. And sometimes it can cause us to go weary, be discouraged, or like I gave out in the introduction, the election. <clears throat> and discouragement that came in as a result of it. Solomon recognizes, he saw this happening all the time, and he said, listen, this is vanity. But we have to understand a few things here. Just like he was, as he was coming to you off of verses 12 and 13, we only see the surface and God sees it all. Don't forget that. God is in control. No one's going to get away with anything. No one. Perfect justice will come in everything. In everything. It will come. Our responsibility is to trust God. The injustices will happen. But in the end, everything will be made right. Remember, God's timing is, our, is not our timing, and His ways are much higher than our ways. God does reward and God does punish perfectly. It's not to your standard. It's to his perfect standard and what he knows has to be done. He doesn't do it on your time frame. He does it on his because he is God. <clears throat> I remember, I know I've seen it different times where God has straighten injustices quickly and other times I, 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 that will come and that might be when eternity hits. I remember when Brother James, this actual event happened right before I arrived in the field. He's the one I trained to be the pastor of the work in Soho and he's now pastor in Port Moresby. And they, that's, this is when they set his, uh, the bush house there on the church property on fire. And these are bush houses. They go up in seconds when you light them on fire. So some Catholic men from the village had come in and lit it on fire with him and his family inside the house. And then they had busted up the church house. Um, and, and so, of course, he had knocked down a wall and got his family out. They, they were fine. They were unharmed in it. Of course, he lost a little library he had. The house burned to the ground in minutes. And uh, what was interesting, though, within 12 months of that event, the men who burned the house, all of them were dead dead all by different means all, one a tree fell on Boop, dead one thing that prevented was any more problems from that group no more problems i was there for the next 12 years and no problems at all yet of course there were other events that i saw you know that that didn't make sense that i, I remember seeing the injustice take place for instance shortly before i left as you know a year before i left we had that gruesome murder that took place on our church property and then to watch a man who was my best friend there, nothing to do with it, just a godly man, arrested for it, knowing it was out of a vindictiveness that it was done, and heading to the nasty prison that I'd preach in from time to time, which is a horrible, horrible, rotten place, and head there with him in tears behind that fence saying, please get me out of here, please get me out of here, and telling some of the things that were taking place just horrible and wondering why it's an injustice so we got to trust God that he'll make it right and he did by the way the Lord did make it right <clears throat> in eternity there will be perfect justice I'm going to read from an old commentator on this verse, what he said. I liked his words on it, so I thought I would just quote him directly. He said, The good man in this world often meets with this mistreatment and is placed in the circumstances which attend the career of the vilest, while the wicked man offsits sits in the highest place and mockingly sways his way about with the arrogant pretentiousness of usurped power. He thinks his position is the reward of his genius and scoffs at the idea of anything having to do with his elevation but himself. These reverse positions clearly show that the reward or punishment of the good or wicked does not necessarily begin and clearly does not end with this mortal life. That's very true. 
those things will happen. We live in a sin-cursed earth. Those injustices will happen. What we trust in, where our encouragement comes in, is the day comes when all will be made right. That will happen. So don't allow the discouragement to come in. Regards to election or, or individual things, you press on. The fact is, Jesus Christ is still king of the universe, regardless who's in the White House. That's not going to be overturned. There's not going to be any, uh, what, 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 what did they just go through with Trump? What's that called? Impeachment. There's not going to be any, any impeachment taking place. <clears throat> and as much as any group in the United States or any other nation tries to remove God, the fact is Jesus Christ will always be king of kings. Now he brings up a really good point in verse 15. Look at this. It's, it, it's, it's really important. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God hath given him under the sun. Well, where is he going with this contextually? What, what, what's his point here? I think it's an important one. He's saying, you know what, we're going to see injustices we're going to see the wicked who are just over and over and succeeding. We're going to see those trying to serve God, suffering. He said, we're going to see many times things that are reversed. Things that we don't think. Because we know the Bible teaches God punishes disobedience and he rewards obedience. But at times, on this side of eternity, from our limited surface view, we don't see it, we don't see it happening. He said, listen, those things are going to occur. But he said, listen, don't allow this to steal the joy that God has given you in this life. That happens all the time. Christians live apart from the joy, forgetting all the blessings that God is giving them. Forgiving the very life that God has given you. Some even choosing asceticism as if, it is a, as if it's a, 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 an honor for what they're doing for God. <clears throat> our joy should be unchanging because our God is unchanging. He's trying to say, don't let the trials of this life and all the injustices, don't let it steal you from enjoying what God has given you in life. We can get so caught up in all the trials and the circumstances, we do lose sight of the good things that God has put into our life. Going around miserable with everything that's happened recently, and those are things we need to pray about. But don't forget the health you have to come to this church service right now. You're not laid up in a bed like Eric Jensen is, un unable to stand now for three months. Don't forget God's blessing. Isn't the devil great at that? He'll get you focused on something. And that's what, that's what he's saying here. He says, listen, we know that this is a sin cursor. We know there's injustices. But still, don't lose sight of this, this amazing life that God has given us. <clears throat> don't forget what you have. We don't have to mope around defeated. If you have good health, enjoy it and be thankful. I, I do know this. When I, when I was down for those two weeks with COVID, I was miserable. I mean, malaria, I was only down for three or four days. Uh, but by day 10, I'm not kidding you, Lord. I was praying. I'm like, just give me five minutes of relief right now. Just, I, I, I was dead serious. Just, like, just give me five minutes of a break of this. And, and just thinking, I remember I, I was in the shower to stand there thinking, I can't wait till this is over. I mean, I cannot wait till this is over with. Be thankful if you have that good health right now. Be thankful if you're able-bodied and you have that job that you can work. Be thankful for that. Be grateful for God's provision, the strength that he's given you. Don't always look on the negative in what you don't have. Don't lose sight of what God has given you. And it's not a sin to enjoy it. So don't forget the blessings of God. If not, you're in danger of this, thinking the wicked have it better. Thinking they have it better. Is that true? Of course not. Is the wicked's earthly comfort better than the grace we get from God? There's no way. There's no way. As we know, Christ is worth more than all the silver and gold this world can offer. This world can offer. 
Do we have a lesser portion because we serve the Lord? Oh no, we have the greatest portion because we serve God. So point being, allow the faith that we had to, to, to bear fruit, to be living in your life. That you don't grow so discontent when we see the, the effects of a sin-cursed world. In other words, don't allow this world to throw a cloud on God's goodness. Lastly, verse 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night see it sleep with his eyes, then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it, yet farther... Though a wise man think to know it, yet he shall not be able to find it out. Interesting here. And this one, from what to consider here for the advice for life is this, is, and I'll tie, it'll make sense here in a second, is you have to consider your limited understanding. The fact is what he's driving at is we need to accept what we cannot know or we cannot understand. There are things that happen that you just won't understand. There are things that will happen that, that you, you just can't obtain to the knowledge of. Here is the wisest man who ever lived. And one of the major things his wisdom taught him was how much he didn't know. He knew his knowledge of the wisest man who ever lived was like one drop in all the oceans. There was so much He was unable to comprehend. We are ignorant and we have to understand the level, that that, that humility that brings, the, the level of ignorance that we truly have, especially in this sinful nature that hinders us and even in our quest for knowledge. Again, so how does this affect us? There are times we don't understand. There are things we cannot know. And we have to be careful that when those times hit, that we don't allow discouragement to set in. Do you see the pattern? He's hitting on key things that tend to set us back and down. And control your thoughts. We need to accept by faith what we cannot understand or know. A great verse that came to mind immediately as I read that, by the way, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children that we may do all the words of of this law forever. There are certain things that are secret and will not be revealed. There are certain things that God will not give the understanding right now for or the knowledge for. And he has a reason for it and we trust him. There are certain things that are going to happen that we don't understand. Look over to Romans chapter 11. Look at Romans chapter 11. This verse is it's true. The others aren't, but this one is. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now get this. Where does he go with it? How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We like that verse. We can quote it. But sometimes when an event comes up and we lack the understanding, we can struggle. You have to trust them. I, I would imagine between the Watt family and the Sites family, there was times of a lack of understanding. I would imagine the same thing I, th- I thought of when I was doing that. I thought of the Sites and Watt family with the tragedy that happened several years ago. I thought of at times where even with Sharon, who will be speaking on, on Saturday. I have no doubt with the loss of her husband, there's times she just didn't understand that. I know with my son, there was times he just didn't understand. There's times you have to trust God and understand, I, I don't have to understand or know everything. I just have to be in a right relationship with the one who does. What you have to settle is that God is good and that God does love you. And you trust him. 
Because that's true. We trust that God is good and that all will be made right. And he, by the way, and he has given us enough that is revealed that we can trust him. We do not have a blind faith at all. There is no way. There is so much substance and so much there. It's not a blind faith. There is so much that has been revealed that between that and God's grace that we have enough. And let's face it. We are here for such a short time. That, that was his point where he said that in his wicked, his days will not be prolonged. He, he said it in the first verse when he got there, but then he came back and he said, well, his days aren't going to be prolonged, but he put in context just how short life is. For me, when this life ends, it's just beginning. I have eternal life now. But for the wicked, they will face eternal death. A, a separation from God for an eternity. So, there are going to be things in life that we cannot know and that we cannot understand. Just like Solomon said, you can take the wisest man who says, I am going to get this, and Solomon basically is laughing. You're never going to get it. It's not going to happen. You cannot nearly comprehend what the Creator is doing. What we have to do is trust Him. He's shown us how good He is. I mean, even right now. This earth still spinning here. Life flourishing. Yet this is a wicked world. He's showing us grace and goodness. You trust him. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Anyone here say, Pastor, please. My salvation has been bothering me. Maybe it started this week. I need you to pray for me. I am not certain that I am converted, and I do need you to pray for me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Anybody here like that? Just raise your hand. I see a couple of small children. That's all I see. All right, Christian. Maybe the Lord worked on your heart tonight. Maybe there's things that's had you discouraged. Maybe with the different injustices that we're seeing. Listen, God is in control. Things will be made right. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. You make those decisions in light of eternity. Not just the here and now. And so as you approach this life with that in mind, Solomon says, listen, don't forget to enjoy what God's given you. You don't have to be miserable. And there are going to be things that we don't understand. We trust him. Father in heaven, bless his invitation, work in hearts and lives. So I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Turn to page 534. And if you need to come...